Judges chapter 6. I, uh, I've preached this years ago. Uh, you may or may not remember it. I probably don't remember exactly how I preached it. Uh, but we're, I'm just going to take it easy on everybody for a while. And preach to you the life of a man whose life may sound very familiar to you. So this may be more along the lines of teaching. Um, some call it character studies out of the Bible. Um, when the Bible, when we call the Bible the book of life, it really is. And it's not just a generalized book of life. It is the book of your life. If you will look in here, you will find everything about you is in the Bible. How many of you know that so far? Okay, uh, you have gone through things that somebody in this Bible has gone through it. And the Bible points that out to you when, when Paul said there is no temptation but such as common to man. Everything that you go through, somebody else has gone through it and somebody in the Bible has gone through it. In Hebrews, in fact, uh, hold your place there in Judges. Because I was going to use this for a, a source text and I didn't put it in my notes. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11 is what we call the faith hall of fame. And Hebrews 11 gives you a rundown of all the various people in the Old Testament whose lives we can look at and say... That's me. That's where I'm at right now. Uh, Hebrews 11, we, it starts with Abel. Verse 5 talks about Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, um, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. Uh, and talks about Joshua and the walls of Jericho. Rahab the harlot. Verse 31. Who believed what the two spies told her. She believed the two witnesses. And because she believed it, God saved her. God, these witnesses knew what kind of woman she was. And they did not say to her, Well, man, we'd love to save you, but you're one of those. And we just don't want none of your kind in with our people. They didn't say that. Not only did she, was she saved when Jericho fell, but everybody in her house was saved with her. Not only that, but in Matthew chapter 1, you find out, and here's my guess, one of those two spies that ended up staying, hiding out in her house, I think one of them fell in love with her. Because she is one of the matriarchs that show up in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Rahab the harlot was the great, 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 something another grandmother of Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a lesson here. Every grandmother has a history. Amen? I mean, you show up in the world and they're sweet little old ladies. They weren't always that way. Amen. They're sweet little old ladies now because they're trying to get to heaven. But back in the day, they were something different. But then Hebrews, it goes through a quick rundown. If you look in verse 32 of Hebrews chapter 11, what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson. And of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Did you know your Bible says the word aliens in it? The armies of the aliens. I wonder if that's prophetic. 
fact, I know it is. Verse 35, women received their dead raised to life again and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Underline that in your Bible. They were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. What is the worst thing that Satan's people can do to you? Kill you. In fact, the worst thing that Satan's people can do to you is make you live. The best thing they can do to us is kill us. Because we have a far greater life waiting for us. Do you believe that? Say amen. So others had trial of cruel markings and scourging. Yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. That means exactly what you think it means. Cut in half. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. I dare, uh, what's his name, Joel Osteen to preach this message. I dare him to preach Hebrews twelve thirty seven, Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. You see that in your Bible? It says that all of these Old Testament heroes were waiting on something. And what they were waiting on was us. They're waiting to meet us in the resurrection. Because the Bible says when, when, the, when the translation, when the rapture happens, who's going up first? The dead in Christ. That would be... Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Joshua, Moses, Gideon. They've been waiting all this time for us so that when they're called up first, we will meet them in the air. That's why in verse uh, 1 of chapter 12, it says, Seeing then that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That, and see, we're supposed to meet Jesus in the clouds, are we not? He's telling you in verse 1 of chapter 12 what those clouds are. The clouds are the dead in Christ that went up first. They're waiting on us. And they are a cloud of witnesses to us that if they can make it, you can too. Amen? Judges chapter 6. <clears throat> I've got, basically I've got... All of Judges chapter 6 in my notes. I don't have anything else beyond that. And I know that I'm not going to try to preach the entire chapter to you today. But we're going to do a character study on the life of one man. And years ago when I studied this man out, I saw in Gideon... A very, very clear reflection of myself. Gideon, and you're going to see this in all that we're going to read about him. Gideon was not one of these men that as soon as God said something, Gideon said, that's it, let's go, come on, I'm ready. That was not Gideon. When you look at Gideon, and what famous story do we know about Gideon? What, what was the one big thing that he's noted for? Huh? The fleece. That wasn't what I was thinking of, but I'll take that. Because that is one of the things that he's noted for. Huh? Reading the word. He started out with a huge army. And what did God do with it? He whittled it down to how many men? 
300. So Gideon, with an army of 300 men, destroyed the enemy. Okay? Um, Gideon is always... How can I put this? The way I put it years ago was, he is a picture of an insecure believer. I mean, he believes God. Sometimes. But Gideon is one of those that always has to have assurance. Always. He is, he's full of doubt. He does not elevate himself as some high and mighty person. So when the Lord tells him, Gideon, I'm going to use you to destroy the enemies. Gideon said, really me? How, how in the world are you going to do that? He doesn't automatically just accept the first thing that he's told, even when it comes from God. He's got to know for sure before he'll do it. He's got to, I got, I got to have a sign. God gave him a sign. I got to have another one. And God gave him another one. And you're going to see that in his life. If you are the kind of person that hesitates when others are ready to move forward, if you're kind of the person that thinks that you're not good enough or you're not, um, you don't have enough vocabulary, you're not good at speaking to people, you're not good at being the forefront. I mean, he's picking Gideon to be the head of his army and Gideon is not officer material, definitely. Because his whole life is full of doubt rather than faith. And yet, the Bible puts him in the faith hall of fame. He's just, he's a lot like me and maybe a lot like uh, people in my family or a lot like some of you. I've got people in this church in mind when I think of Gideon. Because sometimes you think, I don't think God can use me. Because of what I was, what I used to do, how I used to be, how I am now. I don't think God's going to do all that stuff in the Bible sounds good, but that's got to be for other people because I just don't, I don't match up to it. And so let's just kind of go through Gideon's life and we'll see this and we'll see how God had patience with him and God used him. And if God can use Gideon, I promise you. I promise you, you are not insignificant when it comes to your Father who's in heaven. One of the things that we know about God is that He is no respecter of persons. Some of you can sing, some of you can't sing. God does not favor the people that sing over the people that can't sing. Some of you can teach, some of you can't, don't want to, never want to. God does not favor those who have an ability or a gift over those who don't have that same ability or gift. Every part of the body of Christ, if God didn't think it was necessary for you to be there, you wouldn't be there. So if you are part of the body, God has you there for a reason. There are some people in the Bible that you read their name basically one time. And you see one thing they do. And then the Bible moves on to somebody else. Does that mean that that person who's only mentioned once. Is of lesser significance to the kingdom and body of God. Than like David who's mentioned all over. Abraham or Moses who gets all this press in the Bible. If God didn't need that one person whose name is only mentioned one time, who we find does one thing in the Bible, if God didn't need that person, you'd never know about him. But whether they're mentioned once 
or a thousand times in your Bible, God picked them, God used them for what He wanted to use them for, and they get just as much a crown of glory as anybody else does. What is the reward of God? What is it we're hoping to attain when we get out of this life and we go to heaven? What is it that we are going to get as our reward? Is some, is some of you going to get a bigger mansion? Some of you going to have a whole section of heaven named after you? And then the rest of you maybe have a little, little place here and, or maybe something a little bit out of town and maybe one person in heaven gets a lot of riches and maybe you don't get a lot of riches. Is that how it is? I don't think so. God told Abraham, I am thy exceeding and great reward. The only reward that I'm interested in in heaven is the Lord. And just being there with Him. That's all I care about. So, I mean, if you, I don't think you are, but if you think that if you do more, you accomplish more in the church, or you pay more tithes, or you attend more times, or you do this more, you do that more, that you're going to get more of God than the rest of us? It don't work. I think in heaven, everybody's the same. And I think down here, when God looks at each one of us, He sees us all the same. Because He doesn't really see us, He sees Jesus covering us. So if He looks at you, and He sees His only begotten Son, then you're going to get what He gives His only begotten Son. Does that make sense to everybody? So, with that in mind, let's look at Gideon. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Now, let's pray, and then I'll, I'll just kind of... Uh, I'll, I'll try to follow the Holy Ghost in this, alright? Heavenly Father, I ask the Lord for your help and your blessing, preaching this message, teaching... Uh, Lord, teach it to me, teach it to those that are here this morning. I thank you, Lord, for bringing them here. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them, and God, that you would love them. And Lord, for the many people that are watching online, Lord, we know that the people sitting here in this church are no better than the people who are sitting in their homes watching us here, because you're just as much there as you are here. And Father, whether it's in Missouri, whether it's other places in America, or Canada, or even in Kenya. God, you're there with your people. And Father, I thank you for that. And I pray, dear God, that you'd add your blessings to your word. Lord, help me to follow the Holy Ghost as we go through this, Lord, and get some understanding about why things happen in our life that they do. Why we sometimes struggle with whether or not we're good enough to merit God's blessings. God, help us, Father, to see ourselves in Gideon, and we thank you for him. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said. Now, just this verse 1, very quickly, if you do a study of the book of Judges, you will see a cycle. Israel went in a repetitious cycle. They fought for the land, they got the land, God gave them the land according to His promise, but they did not remove all of the enemies that were in that land. God told them to, but they didn't do it. Then we find out in Judges uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3 that God is the one who actually left some of those enemies inside the land of Canaan because He said Joshua and his generation who fought the war to get the land they're dead and gone. And now we have another generation that is reaping the benefits of the war that was fought. They themselves don't know how to fight a war. So I'm going to leave some of their enemies in their midst so that they will learn how to fight. 
Take that into consideration when you read this. When God saved you, He never promised you that upon your salvation, He's going to remove all of your sin, all of your temptations, all of your lust, all of your pride. He never said that He was going to take it all away from you and give you the easy road to heaven. He didn't do it with me, and He's not doing it with you. He left... I mean, think about it. The World War II generation... Where are these guys? They're all but gone. There's a few of them left. But for the most part, that generation is gone. And they fought a terrible war. And when they came back, things to them were precious. They didn't throw stuff away. That just because something didn't work right, they didn't discard it. They tried to fix it. They made things right. When I go around and I see these old guys wearing these army hats or these navy hats or these marine hats, and I shake their hand, I get the handshake of a man, not some little snowflake biscuit. Sir, thank you for serving your country. Well, I did my best. I don't get that. I get, well, you're welcome, son. That's the kind of guys that fought, amen. You look back on your grandpa's life. He was a man. Amen? May have been lost, but he was a man. And we've lost that. we got a bunch of sissy snowflakes in this country that every little thing is an inconvenience to them and they want everything their way and they know nothing about what it takes to keep a country safe and to keep a country free. They know nothing about it. And so God, with me told me, Mike, I'm not going to give you the easy way out. I want to teach you how to fight. I want to teach your hands how to know warfare. And you're going to go, Mike, you're going to be good for a while, and then you're not going to be good, and then you're going to have to fight your way back up, and I'm going to help you, and it's just going to happen over and over and over again. So that's why the children of Israel, when they did evil in the sight of the Lord... God delivered them into the hand of the Midian seven years. The Midianites were their enemies. God handed them over. And he said, I'm going to teach you a lesson. So verse 2. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. In other words, the Israelites had to flee and go hide out because of the Midianites. Verse 3. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they camped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come into Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. Now, I'm going to give you my opinion of something. I think we have an adulterous president. But he's not wrong in wanting to protect the interest of this nation. Because what's happening is, because of the wickedness of our country, I can clearly see that our increase in this country is being flown overseas. And we've entered into trade agreements that favor the Chinese and the Europeans, and everybody else except us. We're sowing the seed, and the Midianites are coming in and taking it away from us. So we have nothing. That's because of our wickedness. So verse 5. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. I think that a day worse than the Great Depression will probably come to this land. Now, let me bring it down to your level. There have been times and there will be times... 
when God will make sure that you're bankrupt. You ever had problems paying your bills? You ever had problems when it just seemed like you prayed and you cried and you read the Bible and you did everything you thought was right and ended up still with nothing? God is the one who did that. God impoverished you and he took away everything that you had. He didn't do it to be mean. He didn't do it because he hated you. He did it because he loved you. And he wanted to teach you that depending on your wealth and depending on your character and depending on your strengths is not where it's supposed to be for you. He will take everything away from you so that you will learn that if you don't depend on God, you're gone. So you might be in a situation now where you can see yourself greatly impoverished. Spinning your wheels. Doing everything. And nothing's happening. I've been there. And I will probably be there again sometime. Just because sometimes when God teaches us a lesson... We only know it for a little while and have to be retaught the lesson over again. Mom, did I ever get a whipping for doing the same thing over again? I, I didn't ask you, sister. Thanks. Mom loves me more than she does you. I got a whipping for something, but apparently didn't learn my lesson because I went out and did it again. And I had to get another one. And still, there were some things I said, ah, I'm not going to do that again. But part of my nature growing up, there was just some things that I was never going to change. And no amount of whippings was going to do it. I had to learn it again and again and again and again. Sound familiar? This is you. This is your life. Now turn to verse 7. Now we're going to look at the reason why God chooses Gideon. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. That sounds like a mom or a dad. When they're scolding you because you did something stupid and they're telling you, I carried you in my body for nine months. I fed you and I clothed you and I did all kinds of things for you. Why do you do this to me? Sound familiar? This is God reminding Israel what he did for them. And I'll say this, every now and then, I think God will take us aside and remind us what He has done for us, and how we have no right to complain, and how we have no right to be rebellious against the God that took very good care of us. Raise your hand if God's been good to you all the days of your life. God is not done you any wrong but you despise God in that in his goodness to you you used it as an occasion to sin we do it every time every time Verse 9, that I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. The 21st century equivalent to that, of course, is 
Here's God's voice right here. God said, listen to me, Bethel. God said, do something, and you decided you didn't have to do what God said. Or God said, don't do this, and you made the decision. I can do this if I want to. We are more rebellious than we let on. Amen? I'm not preaching against you. I'm preaching with you. Because I am part of that rebellion. I know all about it. God says, don't do it. I did it. God says, do this. I didn't do it. And no good reason other than I either didn't want to do it or I wanted to do it. It's that simple. Bottom line is, I hate my flesh. And I wish at times that God would go ahead and deliver me out of it. Because it's wicked, it's rebellious. It does not take into consideration the fact that God has kept me alive and blessed me all these years. And my wicked nature still wants to go and not obey the voice of God. Now look at verse 11. We're going to meet Gideon. And I'll give you this and send you home. Verse 11. There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abiezrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. I want you to think about what he's doing. He lives in an oppressed land. A land where the Midianites, wherever they see grain out in the field, the Midianites say, the Jews aren't going to get that. That's ours. We're going to take it from them. And so here is Gideon hiding his threshing from the Midianites because if the Midianites catch him doing it, they're going to come steal it and probably kill him. Now, there's, a, I, there's an illustration in my mind that I want to say, but I don't think that right now it really applies to us because right now I can go anywhere in this land and sit down and read my Bible and I don't care who sees me do it. I can share the Bible with people and I don't care whether they like it or not, but I don't care that the government... Here's me talking about the Bible because I'm not afraid that they're going to come and get me because of it. We don't live in that land yet. But we could. But there are people around the world that live in an oppressed situation where they cannot just overtly believe the Word of God, share the Word of God, so the word of God, because they'll get killed or sent to prison for it. So they kind of know what this is like, but we don't right now. So verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now underline that in your Bible. Because what you're going to see coming out of Gideon's mouth he doesn't believe that he is a mighty man of valor. He does not believe that. And so, I want you to consider this for a little bit. I want you to consider your life, how you've spent your life, what you've done in your life. And even though you're a Christian, there's just so many things that you've been a part of in your life and it kind of holds you back from really just jumping in and serving the Lord and doing whatever it takes to witness, to talk to people, to sow the Word of God or to do some bold thing because you don't see yourself that way because of how you've lived your life, where you've been, what you've done. Am I making sense to you? You... 
still remember the bad things you did. You remember almost every one of them. And in your heart, the phrase, mighty man of valor, just does not, it doesn't rest on you because you don't think you're worthy of it. When I talked to the pastors out in Kenya, I knew I could just tell that some of them were not very well educated. And maybe in, if they were here in America, we might say to them, you're not really qualified to be a pastor. But in Kenya, they need pastors bad. And in some cases, it's just somebody who was willing to take the position. Even though they don't read very well, or they have not been educated well, or whatever. And, here's, and I said this to them, and I'm going to say it to you. God does not call you because you're qualified. He qualifies you. When he calls you. God. Makes. What he wants. You to be. Not chooses you. Because you're already there. Does that make sense? Amen. And all of this. Rests in God's providence. I have. Several times. Been alone with God saying, God, you made a huge mistake calling me to be your guy. And sometimes I felt that way, that he made a huge mistake. But, the Bible says the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. If God calls you, He's not ever going to be sorry that He did. Because what God wants out of you and got what God wants you to do, He will do it in you when you let Him do it. Amen? If you, let's be honest, if you think that you are one of the worst sinners with the worst past in Bethel Church, raise your hand. God bless the rest of you. That's good. You're on a good start. Because the people that God picks, and for whatever He's going to do with you, doesn't have to be preaching. Doesn't have to be in front of the camera or the microphone all the time. Whatever God chooses to do with you, He will make you that person. Because that's what He does. We're made out of dirt, we're made out of clay, and we are all as clay in the hands of the potter. And He decides to make us what He wants out of us. Not what we think we are or what we already are. So you look back here at this statement in verse 12. The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. The angel of the Lord already knows what He's going to use Gideon for. And He's not making a mistake in choosing this man because he knows this man doesn't already think that he is a mighty man of valor. John, close that window for a second. I'm going to talk about you. One of the reasons why I feel like 
God laid John on my heart, and then when I shared it with the board, I was, I was in awe of the unanimous decision that I let them make. Because John said, I don't think I'm worthy of that office. I said, that's exactly why you're the right guy. You see, churches have deacons. They have deacons all over the world. And some of these deacons are real high-headed and high-minded about themselves and about their power. And they think they're the pillars of the church. And those are not the people that God called. God calls the lowly. The ones who don't want to be in the spotlight or the limelight. The ones who already are working behind the scenes to be the right hand man of the church. He's been doing the job without having the title. And that's why we picked him. Okay, John, you can listen now. So look at verse 13. I'm going to cut you loose out of here. Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Look at him. Listen to, listen to his heart. He's angry. He's angry that he has to hide his threshing, thinking that any minute the Midianites are going to catch him and steal all of his food away from him. If, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. If you have ever questioned God about what he's doing, you're doing the right thing. Because if we can't tell God how we feel, who can we tell? Because probably all of us have been in a situation where we said, God, why did you leave me? Why did you forsake me? God, why did you let this happen? If you're the God who loves us and does all these great things for all these people in the Bible, why aren't you doing it for us? You've been there. And if you can't tell God how you feel, who can you talk to? Amen? Verse 14. The Lord looked upon him and said, Look at what he said. Go in this thy might. He's saying to Gideon, Gideon! That is exactly the attitude that I'm looking for. Somebody who really recognizes how bad it is. Somebody who also recognizes that in times past, I was always their God to bail them out, to bring them, to lead them, to save them, to destroy their enemies. That's the kind of guy God is looking for. you got the right attitude because you remember how I've done it before and you're saying, God, are we not due for another miracle? Are we not ready for this? So the angel said, go in this thy might and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, and you underline this in your Bible, O my Lord, wherewith Shall I save Israel? How? How can I do this? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. You remember David? King David? When Samuel went to the house of Jesse to pick a king, Jesse said, i got my seven boys right here. Here's the oldest here. Does, that, doesn't he look like a king? Jesse was trying to point Samuel out to the best of his boys and say, surely one of these top three boys right here 
Surely these are the men that's going to be the king. And when Samuel had looked through that whole lot, he asked, Is there not another son? Well, yeah, there's David, but he's young. I've got him out tending sheep, and I just didn't think that he was the one that you were looking for. And Samuel went and sought out David and poured oil on his head and said, You're the man that God is looking for because you're a man out of God's own heart. My family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. I want you to bow your head. That's a great way to close the sermon, isn't it? I'm not going to have a big invitation. I just I want to have time of reflecting and prayer. There are no politicians that come to Bethel Church. There are no company executives that come here. There are no wealthy doctors or lawyers that come here. The people that God drug in here kicking and screaming were the sinners, the drunkards, the whoremongers, the proud, arrogant. God drug sinners in here. God drug people in here who are poorly educated. God brought people in here who have not read thousands of books, gone to numerous classes, attained the various degrees. To put it bluntly, God brought here the poor so that He could bring down the rich. He brought into this church the foolish so he could confound the wise. God brought in here the weakest ones so that he could bring down through them the mighty and the strong. Don't you ever How can I say this? You are never too bad, too poor, too foolish, or too weak to serve God. However, you may be too smart, too strong, and too wealthy to do it. And God can't use them. The wealthiest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, the guy who owns Amazon.com, will more than likely never read his Bible and believe it. He doesn't need it. And God's not going to call him. And yet God has given you, if you know that God created the universe in six days, 6,000 years ago, and Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and he's coming again... If you know those things, you're smarter than all the philosophers. You're greater than all the mighty men. And you're better qualified to serve God than anybody else in this world. This morning, with your head bowed, will you ask God, God, can I serve you? God, can I, can I be a soldier in your army? God, can I be a doorkeeper in your house? Anything, God. Can I do that? As bad as I've been, as much as I've ruined my reputation amongst most people, can I still serve you? Will you still use me? 
You know, God can pick Gideon. He can pick you. Father in heaven, thank you for reminding me of who I am. Reminding me of where I've been, what I've done. Reminding me just how little qualified I have been to be in the position that I'm in. And thank you, God, for making me qualified. Thank you, God, for these people. I thank you, Lord, for the ones that you've led here. They're weak. They're foolish. They're not wealthy. They're not important as far as this world is concerned. But, Father, you're going to use them, and already are, to destroy the strong, to make the wisdom of this world foolishness. Father, help us, dear God, to have that confidence, not in us, but confidence in you. That, God, if you said you'll do it, you'll do it. Father, help somebody today. Help me. Help my family. My girls, my boys, my wife. Help my church people, my friends. Help them, dear God, realize that you're gonna, you've already used them, you're going to continue to use them, and you're not sorry that you selected them. Father, help us, dear God, to call out to you and say, God, can I be used? And I promise, Father, I, Lord, just help them, bless them. Give them that promise, Lord, in their life that you called them and you're not sorry you did. Hear these as they call out to you, hear them as they pray, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. All the God's people said, Amen. Let's stand. Be dismissed. Come back. Be with us this afternoon, 4 o'clock. And then, remember next Sunday, short business meeting. Are you glad you came to the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask His blessings and His grace.